I lost my grandfather, grandmother, an uncle, two aunts and two cousins. One was 11 years old, the other was nine. Imagine that you are a prisoner of World War II, trapped in the relentless web of the Ustasha, a Croatian fascist group supportive of the Germans. Anguish takes hold of you as you realize not only that your likely fate is death, but also that until that moment arrives, you will have to endure inhuman torture. Every moment becomes an anticipated agony because you know your captors not only seek to exterminate you, but also revel in your suffering. Your harsh reality turns into a living nightmare, and though you still breathe, your death has already begun. Today, in this new military history video, we are going to tell you how this ruthless group managed to impress even Adolf Hitler with their methods. Before delving into the actions of this fascist group, let's establish the historical context in which the Ustasha emerged. To do that, we need to go back to the formation of Yugoslavia, the state of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, which was established in 1918 after World War I. In this new formation, the Serbs were the largest ethnic group, playing a significant role in the leadership of Yugoslavia. Their presence was officially consolidated in 1929, when King Alexander the Serbs decreed the country's name change to the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. This act led to the abolition of the constitution and the dissolution of the parliament, exacerbating existing tensions marked by palpable strains. At that time, three very diverse ethnic groups coexisted, each with notably different political and religious perspectives. All of this happened under a single regime that not all inhabitants supported, contributing to escalating discrepancies and tensions in the region. In this context of extreme dissatisfaction, the Ustasha emerged, a Croatian nationalist organization primarily based on religious racism and led by Ante Pavlic. Their goal was clear, to achieve the independence of Croatia, form an independent state, and put an end to what they considered Serbian oppression in Yugoslavia. The problem was that their intentions were based on a policy of racial differentiation and the supposed ethnic supremacy of the Croatian people, whom they considered Germanic. Furthermore, like other nationalist formations of the time, the group was influenced by Italian fascism. It's essential to note that it was never a mass movement but rather resembled a clandestine organization. With the onset of World War II and the Nazi invasion of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, the Ustasha seized power and ruled the independent state of Croatia authoritatively. This new nation, created on April 10, 1941, proclaimed itself free from Yugoslavia, but it is believed to have been under the orders of the Third Reich and thus under Nazi supervision. With total impunity, the Ustasha began arresting inhabitants of Yugoslavia. The ultimate goal of the Ustasha was to create an ethnically homogeneous Greater Croatia by eliminating all non-Croats. While Serbs were their primary target, they also targeted Jews, Roma and political dissidents. Carrying a fervent hatred as their banner, they committed large-scale massacres and established concentration camps in the territory. The largest of all was Jasenovac, known for its high mortality rate and barbaric practices. Additionally, and this is painful to say, it was the only Nazi state to establish concentration camps specifically for children. Proportionally to the population, the independent state of Croatia was one of the deadliest European regimes. Determining the number of victims is complex due to the destruction of many relevant documents and the prolonged inaccessibility researchers have had to surviving documents. However, it is estimated that the Ustasha, the cruelest fascist movement in history, murdered one million Jews, Serbs and Roma during World War II. Between 1941 and 1945, they carried out executions in extermination camps, mass murders, ethnic cleansing, deportations, forced conversions, and war rapes. But it's not just about numbers. It's about the cruelty with which they carried out their acts, 
surpassing any limits of humanity. We know that many episodes from these years are very difficult to hear, but what comes next will truly chill your blood. The main targets of Ustasha's sadism were Serbian priests, women and children. Historian Karl Jans Geischer describes some of the torture methods most commonly used by the Croatian dictators in extermination camps. Before killing the prisoners, they inserted needles under their nails and put salt in the open wounds. The Ustasha loved cutting the noses and ears of victims while they were still alive. This illustrates that, while their ultimate goal was the extermination of those they deemed different, there was a twisted pleasure in witnessing their victims suffer. As mentioned earlier, there was a particular ruthlessness towards women. They were first raped, and then parts of their bodies, such as breasts, were cut off. If they were pregnant, the suffering was even greater. According to testimonies, their bellies were opened to take out their babies, who were then killed. The elderly were not spared from Ustasha terror either. Their eyes were gouged out, and they were buried alive. But the horror wasn't limited to those subjected to violence. It also manifested in everyday life. Witnesses and survivors of terror affirmed that the Ustasha had the tradition, yes, the tradition, of collecting body parts. Many wore necklaces made from the tongues, eyes and ears of their victims. Former prisoner Jovo Juric recounts that during the fascist regime, in some Croatian cities, Serb eyes were sold. Yes, you heard it right, Serb eyes. Can you imagine living through a ruthless war, having lost family members, and going to a fair to see human eyes? Undoubtedly, a cruel nightmare turned reality. Such a structure of destructive power doesn't organize itself casually. It requires a leader more than ruthless. As mentioned earlier, the Ustasha was led by Ante Pavlik, now considered the person who carried out the cruelest fascist movement in history. As you can imagine, to earn this title, one must surpass all barriers that make up human feelings, and he achieved it with a record of a million murders. Pavlik was an unsuccessful lawyer who had started his political career in the Croatian nationalist movement. He was elected a national deputy in 1927 during the early years of the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. At that time, he advocated in Parliament for the independence of his nation, which would not come until Hitler's invasion more than a decade later. With only two years of political career, in 1929, Pavlic had to flee the country for opposing King Alexander I, who, as mentioned earlier, renamed the country Yugoslavia. During his exile, he wandered through Austria, Germany, Bulgaria, and France until, with Mussolini in power, he found refuge in the first fascist regime in history. It was there, during his stay in Verona, that he began planning the Croatian Revolutionary Insurgent Organization, that is, the Ustasha. The Ustasha's terrorist activities reached their peak with the assassination of King Alexander in Marseille on October 9, 1934. Subsequent investigations showed that Pavlic had hired an assassin from the internal Macedonian Revolutionary Organization to carry out the assassination. After such an abhorrent act, Pavlic adopted a much more anti-Semitic discourse and established strong ties with the Italian fascists. It was at that moment that he began spreading the ideas of a nationalist and Catholic Croatian state. The Ustasha group began to establish itself in the territory and did not find a large number of followers for their ideas. However, history would give them a push. The Nazi invasion of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, during which they could unleash the cruelty that later characterized them. Although Italians and Germans who militarily controlled the area held power, they granted Pavlic the autonomy to organize a totalitarian state as he pleased. Like any follower, he excessively revered his idols and used the excessive propaganda characteristic of fascist regimes. However, he was a tyrant without charisma, and despite studying the gestures of his role models, he never managed to captivate his audience faithfully. Whether he had admirers or not, Pavlic was already in power and was willing to do anything. 
He then began a brutal persecution against Serbs and Jews, with the aim of eliminating at least a third of them and converting the rest to Catholicism. Forcing conversion in religious terms was a direct way to make them lose the main differentiating element of their identity. The cruelty of the Ustasha exceeded any limit of humanity, to the point that it didn't matter if those they faced were children. They too were imprisoned in concentration camps and became victims like any adults. Painful techniques and the use of cutting weapons like knives and axes were also replicated on them. On the other hand, they were often the target of torture to increase the torment of their parents. Many children were burned alive in front of their parents, while others were preferred to be drowned in the river. It is unimaginable to think that infants could have lived through such horror. The horror of their actions was such that even the Nazi monsters located in Croatia expressed their horror at the Ustasha terror, considering it excessive and ineffective in their words. The Nazi commissioner, Hermann Neubacher, described these brutalities as the fiercest crime in history, only comparable to Dante's hell. And look who's saying it, a Nazi soldier himself. While the Ustasha murders never had the technical and industrial precision of the German Nazis, their acts of cruelty far exceeded the atrocities of the Third Reich. At times, even Italian soldiers intervened to save a part of the Serbian population in the city of Knin from complete annihilation. To carry out all these types of abuses, just like in Nazi Germany, it was necessary to have architecture designed for horror. Thus, after taking power, the Ustasha built numerous concentration camps. Among many, the one that stood out for its size was the aforementioned Jasinovac, a complex of five camps on the banks of the Sava River, about 60 miles south of Zagreb. It is currently estimated that the Croatian regime murdered between 56,000 and 97,000 people there between 1941 and 1945. In late August 1941, authorities created the first two camps of the Jasinovac complex, Krapje and Brosica. The remaining three were Chiglana, established in November 1941, Kozara, established in February 1942, and Stara Gradishka, which had been an independent detention center for political prisoners since the summer of 1941 and was converted into a concentration camp for women in the winter of 1942. All these spaces were monitored by the Croatian political police and Ustasha Milicia personnel. As expected, the conditions in these detention centers were horrendous. Prisoners received very little food, housing and hygiene facilities were practically non-existent, and, worse still, guards tortured, terrorized, and killed prisoners at will. Deportees usually arrived by train, crowded into wagons, and the Ustasha greeted them with beatings, lined them up, and stripped them of their valuables. Similar to other extermination camps, upon arrival, slave labor commands selected the fittest prisoners. Among the tasks they performed were fortifying defenses, building a dam to contain the flooding of the Sava River, forging chains, cutting down trees, and there was even the function of burying victims of massacres. Undoubtedly, the methods of murder were extremely savage, and what happened inside the concentration camps was no exception. Competitions for quick killings were organized at Jasinovac, where competitors used knives called Serboshek, translated literally as Serb cutter. One of the winners of these bloody competitions was Petar Burzika, who cut no less than the chilling figure of 1,360 prisoners' throats. There were also large bonfires where prisoners were thrown in alive. They were beaten on the head with a huge and heavy hammer to death, or they were thrown into the river to drown. Fortunately, by 1945, this nightmare came to an end. After the defeat of the Axis powers by the Allied forces, the Yugoslav resistance, with the help of the Red Army, expelled the Ustasha from power, marking the beginning of the end of fascist terror. Croatia rejoined Yugoslavia 
as one of the federated republics of the new Yugoslavia. Ante Pavlik managed to escape to Argentina, a country pursued by the secret services of Yugoslavia, who attempted to assassinate him several times. After one of these last assassination attempts, he escaped to Spain. He arrived in Madrid secretly in 1957 and lived in absolute obscurity until December 28, 1959, when he died alone in the German hospital. It is disheartening for history to know that someone who caused so much harm to so many people died in a comfortable bed. Unlike how he would have treated those he considered enemies, the official departed in the law of human dignity. Thus, we reach the end of this video. Thank you very much for staying until the end. If you are passionate about this type of content, you can subscribe and activate notifications to stay informed about new episodes. See you in the next installment of Military History.